I wanna talk about being joyful. Joyful. And um, how many would even say, I wouldn't ma- I mind having some extra joy in my life? How many are sitting by somebody who looks like they need this sermon? No, don't, don't, <laughs> don't raise your hand for that, okay. Fact is, all of us need more of it. All of us need uh, this quality that the Bible speaks of frequently, and all of us need to realize it's better than most of us think because most of us, having grown up in the West rather than the East, where the Middle East, where the Bible really originated from, we, we have words that are more emotional than the Bible actually described them as. So we see love as an emotion where the Bible sees love as a decision, sees it as an action. I choose to love, I'm a loving person. It's not what I feel so much, it's what I do and who I am. Well, so it is with joy. Joy can be described at times as an emotion, but really the Bible sees it far deeper and richer than this emotion that tends to come and go. I kind of used to think about joy as like it was a dessert. You know me with desserts, I, I do like them. But, um, but they're not the main course and I understand that. And so I thought, you know, joy was kind of like that. It's nice to have, you know, it's, it's maybe the, the, the extra thing that you get so, uh, you know, every so often. I've come to believe this. It's not dessert, it's the water of life that you need every day. It's, it's, it's more substantive than most of us realize, and this is why the Bible would want us to be full of it in the sacred sense of that phrase, all right? <laughs> Isn't that the problem, that the world is full of it in a lot of different it's, and, and they need what we have, and so the fact that this is in the Bible is something that needs to get in us. It's not just that we have it, it's that God wants us to be full of it. And so I've, I've met some Christians who I actually have felt like they believe that they're allergic to joy. And here's how it comes out of their mouth. Well, pastor, I'm just being real. No, you're being real grumpy. You're being real negative. You're, you're being, you're being um, real in the flesh because I get how you feel, but we're not supposed to stop at our feelings. We're supposed to go and act as if we're full of the Holy Spirit. And so don't let your emotions dictate when we're actually surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Don't let this thing about I'm my authentic self be your highest mantra. You were never called to be your authentic self. You were called to be like Jesus. That's a whole different way to live. And so in many ways, if you read the Bible, a joyless Christian is an oxymoron. Just like a fearful Christian or a stressed out Christian or a defeated Christian. They're oxymorons. Now that doesn't mean that we don't fall down and have failure. That doesn't mean that fear doesn't get on us. That doesn't mean that even a a grumpy spirit doesn't want to try to get on me. We're human. We We have the flesh and there is a devil. And the devil wants you to find yourself at the lowest version of yourself, which sometimes is your authentic self. You know, your messed up authentic self. And so the devil wants you to stay there. But what Jesus is doing is saying, where you find yourself is not where you need to stay, not with the power of the Holy Spirit. So yes, fear comes on you, but God's not given us a spirit of fear, so we don't stay in fear. Yes, stress and weight and difficulty can come on us, but God has not given us a a spirit of heaviness, but a garment of praise where we rise up out of the circumstance that we might feel. And joy is far more the antidote than many of us realize. So I wanna say it again before we get into the details of today that I believe joy is essential, not optional. That it's a theology all through scripture that we need, and it is the reason why then the Apostle Paul would write this verse. I'm gonna ask you, if you would, in a moment, read Philippians 3, 1 with me, and it's just a single sentence, but it's a powerful sentence because it reflects more than just a sentence. It reflects a theology. Let's read it out loud together. Philippians 3, 1, finally, my brothers and sisters, be full of joy in the Lord. The Apostle Paul who wrote that did not write that when he was drinking a latte on his balcony overlooking the Mediterranean. 
Now, if you ever get a chance to travel uh, to Israel and the Holy Land with Crystal and I, you will have that experience, I, I guarantee you. You'll actually travel all night, you'll wind up in a hotel, you'll wake up in the morning, and you'll open your curtain, and there will be the Mediterranean. And you will have a coffee container in your, your room, and you'll be able to have lattes on your balcony overlooking the Mediterranean. I could see writing that sentence right there. <laughs> be full of joy in the Lord. <laughs> well, that's not where Paul wrote that. You know, God actually didn't give him that option to write it then. God even didn't let Paul write it in the wilderness while he was alone like David did. So even though David was on the run, a lot of times he actually had um, solitude. Solitude is valuable in its own way. Maybe you don't have the Mediterranean, but you know, you just got quietness in the solitude and maybe a brook or something nearby. But God doesn't even give Paul solitude because he's now under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard. They didn't have ankle bracelets back then. You got a guy chained to you, an ankle, uh, a chain probably chained to your ankle and chained to his ankle, standing there 24 hours a day. They would rotate who's there, but somebody was there 24 hours a day. Can you imagine? You got no peace, no, no solitude, no quietness. You're actually under arrest, falsely accused because Rome has basically said, Paul, you're stirring up trouble. It's the beginning of an insurrection against Rome. You're gonna stand before Caesar and all Paul had been doing was proclaiming the love of God through Jesus Christ. So here you are, falsely accused, under house arrest for two years. This goes on two years while well, he's waiting trial. And during that time, Paul sits down and writes that sentence. Finally, brothers and sisters, be full of joy in the Lord. He didn't write it when everything was awesome he wrote it because of a theology that he's living in and under. And if you read the whole book of Philippians, you'll discover that 16 times the word joy in some form shows up. So this is more substantive than most of us realize. And today what I'd like to do to kick off this series, and we'll get to peace in a couple of weeks because it's a series on joy and peace, but I feel like we need a couple of weeks on joy. And the joy of the Lord and what it means. And today, like last week, I wanna start with the whys. I think there's, there's something powerful about getting your understanding deeper, and so that's what why does, and then we can focus on the what, because when your why is strong, your what will be easier. Here's number one. Joy is an expression of faith. Say faith. faith. That honors God for his grace, his help, and his blessings in my life. Again, let me just say this. When most of us have grown up viewing joy as an emotion, it's very easy to believe that that's just something that comes and goes, like happiness. You're not always happy, but the Bible tells us to always be full of joy. So these are two different things. That's why even um, Paul in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians writes these words, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Does that Verse that all appear to anyone is virtually impossible to fulfill? Yes. Always, continually, in all circumstances? Well, if it had to do with an emotion, it would be impossible. You can't always feel a certain way. And then it wouldn't be logical for God to command an emotion, but he can command action. He can do something, speak to us about something that has to do with our faith, where we're always in faith. And now what I'd like to say here about this is, when you, when you think about Jesus, Jesus wasn't always happy. Okay, so that's why what I'm saying, you can kind of just look to Jesus alone. Jesus had moments of sorrow. He goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and the Bible says he weeps. There were times that the um, frustration of working with people, as flawed as his disciples, actually got him frustrated at times. And he rebukes his disciples. He says, how long will you not understand what I'm saying? And so there's frustration. Certainly in the garden before the cross, there is such tremendous stress on him that drops of blood are breaking through his forehead. And so 
This is not saying that there's not times of grief or pain or pressure. But what it is echoing is the fact that we can always come back to using our mouth in a certain way. We can always rely on our faith. We can always have this spirit of joy that's not always jo jovial, but it's something inside of us that is an expression of faith because it's the joy of the Lord. Have the joy of the Lord always in you. Don't give up on it, in other words. And, so, and, then, and then use your mouth appropriately because of it. Because our words are not just noises that come out of our mouth. Our words, the Bible says, are like arrows where, where we point them at, at a target and we say, that's what I want to aim at. They're, they're, um, words are like an anchor, the Bible says, that can, can uh, or a, a, a rudder on a boat that navigates where we go or a bridle in a horse's mouth that directs where this horse goes. So our words are very important and that is where the always comes in. Like always come back and make your faith central. Always let the quality of the, the joy of the Lord be a theology inside of you that by faith you can express gratitude to God for who he is or what he's doing. Because let's just remember this. That even in the middle of dif difficulty, where is the Lord? In the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's what the psalmist says. He's not, he's not jovial. He's not celebrating. There is this, this quiet confidence that gives him the ability to keep moving forward even in the middle of the valley because I can sit in the presence of my enemies, but my cup overflows. His banner over me is love. Divorce papers get served. Uh, the bankruptcy goes through. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. See, joy is up there pushing your head up. When it feels like it's underwater, guess what's there pushing it up? It's the joy of the Lord that's pushing it up and pushing the weight off. That's why you would never want to give up on it. So joy is not silent. It's not weak. It wakes me. It shakes me. It stirs me. It gets me ready to say, who shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I, I believe that neither height nor depth, never, ne neither e angels nor demons nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. That's the joy of the Lord saying that out of your mouth. So can we give the Lord 15 seconds of joyous praise because he's always with us, he's never left us, and we don't need to fear evil because he's with us. See, that's always doing something. It always in the Bible doesn't mean that there's never, you know, that, that you're constantly talking. When it says pray always, it doesn't mean you never sleep. It means you never give up on it. You always stay committed to it. You always stay committed to the topic of joy. You always stay committed to that faith can come out of your mouth, even a joyful expression of that. That's what those mean. It's also a choice. Number two, joy is a choice. Say choice. choice. That looks for what God's up to. I encourage you to go home and read the entire book of First, Philippi or, uh, First Philippians. There's only one of them, so read the first one. <laughs> read the last one. <laughs> Philippians. There's only four chapters. So I meant to say read it the first time or read it the hundredth time. Read Philippians again. Find those 16 times where Paul references joy and notice how often they're connected to him looking for what God's up to. That it's not that we're happy about our circumstances. It's not that we're happy about a Roman soldiers that we're chained to. But I do think joy might tap us on the shoulder and say, because we're talking about what God's up to, Paul, are you chained to that soldier or is he chained to you? 
So you got a captive audience right there, no matter how you cut that one. And so when you're writing the book of Philippians, guess who's looking over your shoulder? Soldier right there. Hey, by the way, I'm writing about being joyful in the Lord. No wonder why some of these Roman soldiers got saved. They couldn't get away from a guy who just didn't act like any other uh, victim or, or uh, convict or, or person chained to them. They've never seen a guy like Paul who's finding God's will in the middle of his lockdown. Don't tell me that the lockdown didn't have purpose. Come on, this is where Paul wasn't building churches and he wasn't out proclaiming Jesus in the way he had been. He wasn't meeting new believers somewhere out on, on the next journey, uh, missions journey he was on, but what he was doing was writing something that would outlast all of his sermons. Think about that. If he would have locked himself in, locked himself down, said, I'm just shut down, I can't do anything, woe is me, this isn't fair, where is God? And he starts having this victim mentality. I don't think he would have ever written the letters that we have, but we not only have Philippians, we have Ephesians, we have Colossians, we have some letters from First and Second Timothy written to, written to Timothy, where he's now on death row, writing about the imminent, the imminent death that he is about to face, but there is still faith. He's even telling young Timothy, stir up the faith that's in you that came on you by the laying on of hands. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young, Timothy. Like he is giving exhortations because he's choosing to see what God's up to. It's a choice. It's a choice. And so at any given point, we could look at our circumstances from the lens of the natural and be discouraged or we can say, Lord, help me to do what James said, James chapter one, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Anybody else glad that he used the word consider? Yeah. Consider means you gotta think about it, you gotta choose it. It doesn't mean you're gonna initially feel it. So the fact is you might start out not feeling anything like doing God's will or seeing it God's way, but that doesn't matter. We're all human, so God says consider it then. Like sit down and choose your faith, recognize how powerful and valuable it is, maybe even reconsider how you're looking at it, ask the Holy Spirit to help you see it differently, and then all of a sudden you see the soldier as an opportunity, not an obstacle. Then all of a sudden you see the lockdown as opportunity to write rather than opportunity to feel sorry for yourself. And so the devil today wants to defeat us, but I think it's the joy of the Lord that, that reminds us, not today, devil. I know what you're up to. You're a liar. You're trying to defeat me. I'm not gonna live in the flesh. I'm not gonna stay in that, that emotion. I'm gonna rise up in the Lord because the joy of the Lord is inside me. And so I'm shaking off self-pity. I'm, I'm not gonna act like a victim. God's called me to be an overcomer. I'm not gonna let pride dominate my life. I'm not gonna let self-doubt dominate my life. I'm gonna let the joy of the Lord get up inside me. I'm gonna choose it. I'm gonna choose to see that God's up to something even in the middle of this difficulty right now. Come on, that's the joy of the Lord helping you see things differently. I'm not saying deny reality. Scripture never teaches that. It never teaches us to look at one thing and say it's not there. What faith does, and I think what the joy of the Lord does, is get us above the natural to see the supernatural because the, the natural isn't the only thing that's happening. So when you look at it, you're not denying it, but you're not stopping at it either because there's something more important than the natural, and it's God's supernatural. You get to it. Don't stop short of seeing the supernatural story that the Holy Spirit can show you. But I believe you've gotta have the joy of the Lord inside of you to get there. Yeah. Consider it pure joy. So I think the devil is coming at Paul, saying, Paul, you're done, it's all over, it's just a matter of time. And Paul's saying, you don't realize there's gonna be some people 2,000 years from now on the other side of the world that are, benefiting from what I'm choosing. 
because I'm going to write some stuff under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say, finally, brothers and sisters, be full of joy in the Lord. And 2,000 years later, devil, there's some Christians who are still going to get excited about that, who are going to be grateful that I wrote those words in lockdown, not on the Mediterranean, where there was a nice spa, and there was massages, and there was room service. Here's number three. Joy is a character quality. Say character quality that the Holy Spirit wants to produce more of in me that blesses me and reflects more of him to others. This is one of the great verses that includes the word joy and it happens to be called the fruit of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who produces those qualities? The Holy Spirit, it's his fruit. He wants to produce them in us. What's the second quality listed after love? Joy. Joy. And then there's a bunch of qualities listed after that, which would simply tell me joy is not optional. It's essential. It's part of the characteristic of the Holy Spirit. It's part of who he is. It's part of him when he comes into our lives that he wants to develop more of of it in us. And so certainly one of the reasons he would do it is because it blesses us. Your life is better when you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit growing inside of you. But I wanna add one more thing. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So when we name ourselves followers of Jesus, we are representatives of Jesus. And so if we don't have some of the qualities that are listed here, let's say we don't have the joy of the Lord, we are bad advertisements to the world. Is this not true? Because would you not rather hang around a joyful person than a grumpy person? I mean, maybe there's a few of you that don't mind, you know, kind of having a pity party with three other people that want to have a pity party. But at some point, how about if I put it this way? When you go shopping um, in the mall somewhere, would you rather be around a bunch of angry shoppers? (laughs) Stressed out shoppers? Shoppers that will take you on and take you out? If you get the gift that they're after? Or would you just rather be around some, some joyful people? You know, it's, it's the holidays and there's joyful singing in the background, it's even songs about joy. Wouldn't you rather have that? Like, it, wouldn't you rather have a person build you up than tear you down? Yeah. Yeah. See, joyful people do that because joyful people have the overflow of something in their lives. They don't have to be taking and taking and cutting and cutting. They can actually let something pour out of them. So it's better to be a joyful person. But I also wanna say it's better advertisement for the world when there's a bunch of people that don't act like the world acts. We got something different. We got the Holy Spirit inside of us. Some of you have thought, I don't have energy to be joyful. I wanna give you number four then. All right? Joy produces strength. Say strength. Strength. And resiliency. When heaviness and fatigue and grief set in. Some of you might have heard this verse before and not knew that it came out of an Old Testament story and didn't know it was in the book of Nehemiah. But it's a powerful verse. Simple again, but powerful. Nehemiah says to all God's people, this day is holy to our Lord Do not grieve for the, read the rest with me, the joy of the Lord is our, is our what? The joy of the Lord is our what? But pastor, I'm too tired to be joyful. Oh no, you got it wrong. It's not that you need strength to be joyful. It's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. You got it backwards. You're thinking that joy is an emotion that you got to stir up and and act and put on a happy face. No, it's not that. It's actually an inner strength that helps you overcome, that gets you to rise up. If you would develop more of it, in other words, if you would actually be in the spirit where more of the Holy Spirit's character qualities are growing inside of you, if you would consider more often, like James said, you know, consider it pure joy because you don't want to lack anything. If all of a sudden you're growing in the Lord, you're going to have the strength that you need. It's not the other way around. And so at the risk of oversimplifying something that's really a deep theology in the Bible, but at the intent of trying to underscore again, joy is bigger than an emotion. 
and that it's not always jovial, it's not always celebrating. Sometimes it's just the strength inside of you that gets you up to move forward in the Lord, to get you um, in the middle of your grief to still keep trusting God, in the middle of your loss to still keep saying, that may have happened, but my God is still sovereign. That may have happened, and I don't fully understand it, but God's bigger than I am. My thoughts are here, but God's thoughts are here. My ways are here, but God's ways are here, so I'm gonna keep trusting. In the middle of my mystery, I'm gonna just keep on trusting. That's, that's just an inner strength. That's the kind of joy that's kind of this inner quality inside of you that just has a holy optimism. That's the word I wanna give you. Joy is a holy optimism that enables me to live and serve and reflect Jesus in positive and productive ways no matter the circumstances. It's holy because it's of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. It's optimism because it's constantly looking forward. It's constantly looking at something. It's choosing its focus. So it's looking at the Lord, who he is, what he's doing, where he is. He's with me, he's not left me. What he's up to, you know, I don't always know, but I know he's good. It's the thing that helps me move forward. So our English word joy is so inadequate for the rich theology that this topic actually is. I want you at least for the sake of today, say maybe I can think about it more like a holy optimism. It gets me up and encourages me and helps me. Sometimes it allows me to celebrate and sometimes I even have the emotion of happiness. But sometimes I just have the strength to keep going because that's part of the joy of the Lord. Christians do get hurt. Christians do suffer, suffer loss. Christians do run out of gas emotionally. Christians can be overwhelmed. They just don't have to stay there because the joy of the Lord is our strength and helps us move forward. So what I wanna do today is give you opportunity, if you don't know Jesus, to invite him into your life because he's the source of all of it. And so there's no way you can have any of what I just said in your own strength. All you gotta do is look at, at the last thou, several thousand years of, of human history and just discover our, our best so fall short. And so what we need is a savior. What we need is a healer, a deliverer, an overcomer. What we need is the Prince of Peace. We'll talk about him in a couple weeks, but we also need a God who gives us the joy of the Lord. And so if you don't have that, you can't get it on your own, but you can get it by faith in Jesus. So I wanna invite those of you that haven't committed your life to Christ, those of you online, you know, today, um, I, I know what day of the week it is, but you might not be listening to this on Sunday. This might be a time where all of a sudden you just came across this message and it's for you. And I wanna pray for you too, and those of you that are in Alamo. But, um, also then, I want to prep all of you. In a few moments, um, I'm going to say amen, and the worship team is going to start leading us in worship. And I said, joy is an expression of faith. So I'm just going to encourage you to do this. No matter how you feel today, let's worship Jesus. No matter what your circumstances are, let's worship Jesus for who he is, even in spite of what you might be facing. And I'm gonna tell you, there's gonna be something that comes into your life. You're gonna start seeing things differently. You're gonna start acting differently, sounding differently. And I'll tell you this, you might even at times, you might even walk out of here feeling differently. Feelings are not the ultimate, but I, I do think God made all of our feelings too. And sometimes some of us came in here so weighed down, but God wants to lift us up. He's gonna make us feel like there's less weight on us, less fear on us. We're gonna feel differently too. So let me pray for that. Let me ask you to do this. If you're in one of our rooms, Dublin, why don't you stand to your feet? Alamo, stand to your feet. The prayer team's gonna come and be available in both of our rooms online. There's uh, people that will be ready to even go one-on-one -on -one in a prayer uh, chat room with you if necessary, or you can submit your prayer request to us, but we wanna pray for you. And I wanna start with those of you that need to accept Jesus. So Father, thank you for um, loving us enough to send your son Jesus. We're gonna celebrate that in just a couple weeks, the incarnation of the Son of God into this world. And then thank you, Jesus, that you actually gave your body for us on a cross. You died in our place. You took what should have been ours. 
Death should have been ours. Hell should have been ours. Separation from God should have been ours. But you suspended yourself between heaven and earth. You paid the ultimate sacrifice as the perfect human being and fully God so you could satisfy all the requirements of God because you're the son of God and all the requirements of man because you're the son of man. And so Jesus, thank you that you did for us what should have happened to us. We should have died in our sins. But instead, we can have life everlasting. If you need to invite Jesus into your life, if you've never committed your life to Jesus, just right now, say in your heart, Jesus, come in. I need you as my Savior. I want to make you my Lord. I make that confession today. I want your forgiveness. I want salvation. I want the Lordship of Jesus Christ running my life from this point forward, I pray. And then for all of us that have already committed our lives to Christ, but Jesus today, we just need to be reminded that there can be a strength in our lives that comes from the joy of the Lord. There can be character qualities that start to refine us, change our way of thinking, break off old patterns and habits to make us new in Christ Jesus.